This episode of Manage Smarter is brought to you by Sales Fuel Coach Candidate Profiles, database diagnostic profiling designed specifically for selecting and screening salespeople. Add zeros, don't hire them. Learn more at salesfuel.com slash hiring. Welcome to the Manage Smarter Podcast with hosts C. Lee Smith and Audrey Strong. We're glad you're here for discussions on new ways to manage smarter, hire, develop and retain talent, improve results and propel team performance to new heights. This is the Manage Smarter Podcast. It's the Manage Smarter Podcast, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Audrey Strong. I'm the Vice President of Communications here at SalesFuel. And I'm C. Lee Smith, the President and CEO of SalesFuel. So our guest today says that most people connect for a need and only for now. Those two motivators are wrong, 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 wrong. Uh, she's a super connector and she knows all about connecting. It's Michelle Tillis Letterman. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Audrey. Michelle is an accomplished speaker, trainer, coach, and author, including the internationally recognized The 11 Laws of Likeability, and just out this year, The Connector's Advantage, seven mindsets, you're going to learn what they are, to grow your influence and impact. Named by Forbes as one of the 25 professional networking experts to watch, former NYU professor, financial executive, she, you say you're a recovering CPA, I laughed out loud when I read that word. <laughs> And you now work with organizations and individuals to help them build real relationships for greater results through your company, Executive Essentials. It's an honor to have you, Michelle. Thanks for coming to the show. Thanks for inviting me. All right. So let's talk about the wrong reasons to connect and what makes a good connector. So those are two totally different questions. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, One you at know, a time. I think you nailed it in the uh, introduction is saying that people tend to go out there and when they need something, when they're in the job search, when they're trying to figure something out, when they're, and it's like, ah, I need a client, I need a this, I need a that, now I will go out. Uh, why, you know, what makes a good connector is somebody who isn't thinking about doing it for a purpose. I always say the difference between networking and connecting is that networking is something you do, but a connector is someone that you are. Hmm. I like that. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Well, what I like about that is that, you know, instead of it being self-directed, you know, where it's all about me, it's sort of like, okay, what can I do for this person and this person? I can connect these two people or I can connect with this person because I can help them. And you know, it, it seems like, it sounds like it's more mutual rather than, than, than selfish. Yeah. And networking can be very mutual as well. It's just the idea that a connector is somebody who approaches life and business and everything with putting relationships first and the idea of having a generous spirit, which is what you're talking about, that mutual give and take, that is just one of the mindsets of a connector. Well, like you said, uh, the number one problem you see is that people don't quit companies. They quit people. Yes. When you walk you know, away. Our, yeah. We don't work for c with companies. We work for people. And the number one reason people give when they leave is I had an awful boss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Couldn't work for them any longer. <laughs> Well, the stats will back that up. And, you know, there's really two different types of mindsets that, that bosses have. It's like either you're focused on people or you're focused on task. And I would think that the, the ones that are focused on people would have a, a greater chance of success being a connector. And those who are focused on the task, you know, always have to be getting things done or always scrutinizing, you know, things that are, are or are not being done or whatever. Those type of people might have you know, or focus more on data, if you will, might have more, a more challenging time trying to be a connector. You know, I did a program yesterday and we were talking, the, the title of the program was The Relationship Driven Leader. And organizations are starting to understand why it's not just individuals that need to be connected, but we need to create connected cultures. We need to create connected leadership because this is important to our business and to our bottom line as well. Mm -hmm. When you build strong work relationships, it is actually a predictor of your happiness and it boosts your productivity by 50%. Wow. Yeah. Um, and it goes, it, there's more. I mean, when you have connected leaders, when your team believes that management has an interest in their well-being and demonstrates that they believe people are valuable, that is the number one driver of engagement. And when you have engagement, over 90% of people will try their hardest at work, which leads to higher productivity and over 200% higher bottom line. So do you want to give us the seven mindsets of a connector? And Lee in particular wanted to zero in on one of them, but let's just start with the seven and then 
I'll let him drill down. <laughs> you, can, you can pick whichever one you want. So the okay. seven mindsets are that connectors are open and accepting. They have a clear vision. They believe in abundance. They trust. They are social and curious. They are conscientious, and they have a generous spirit. So for me, the one I found the most intriguing was trust. Because it seems to me that it's really difficult to be a connector, a manager, a boss, and to be effective at it if you don't have that trust. But what I like about uh, what you're talking about in the book is that it's not just about uh, how other people trust you, but it's also you have to trust yourself. Would you talk about that? Absolutely. I always say you have to give trust to get trust, and that starts with ourselves. We need to trust our judgment. We need to trust our gut. We need to... Um, feel that we are um, in control. And so there is this idea, um, when we talk about this concept of accountability and conscientiousness, there's a difference between uh, learned helplessness and learned control. Mm -hmm. So if you think about organizations with that, that pointing finger culture, why didn't you, why didn't they, you know, and it's, it's always about somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's learned helplessness. A connector that is trusting and trusted understands that they own the results of their actions, both good and bad. You talk about uh, four pillars of trust. Yes. Uh, and we should, what, uh, what are those? So the four pillars are authenticity, right? You can't connect with somebody who's not being real. Vulnerability, which I know it sounds like a dirty word, but vulnerability is not about weakness. Vulnerability is about openness. And I always say that vulnerability leads to credibility. We make our choices with who we're being vulnerable with and what we're being vulnerable about. But when you are vulnerable, you are building that trust. You are giving that trust and you receive that trust in return. Transparency is the third pillar of trust. And I, I'm always explaining that transparency doesn't mean telling everybody everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but transparency is letting people know what you can tell them, when you can tell them, why you can't tell them. It's keeping them in the loop. Mm -hmm. And the fourth pillar is consistency because nothing of this matters if you're not consistent. Well, and you have done a survey and say that what 98% of connectors that are bona fide connectors are genuine in all of their communication. And that's what creates trust, I would think. Yes. You know, it, it is that consistency. It is that I know what to expect. I do an exercise where I ask people to define the word trust. I mean, think about it for a second. How would you in your head define this word? And I know we want to go up to dictionary.com and, and Google it. <laughs> um, and I've never gotten the same definition twice, but there is uh, a definition that I thought was really simple that was given to me in a class once. And they said, trust is the expectation of predictability. Oh, that's mm. fascinating. Right? So what are some of the ways in which managers or bosses breach trust? And then once, and then once they do two-part question, what, once they do that, how do they get it back? <laughs> That's the harder question, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, you know, when we think about how trust is broken, sometimes it's broken in ways that we don't even realize. Um, we break confidences. Maybe we didn't realize they were supposed to be confidences. Maybe we did. Um, we gossip. We say one thing and do another. We don't do what we say we're going to do when we say we're going to do it. Um, and I actually had somebody once say, uh, we break trust by spying. And I thought, well, really? You're spying in an organization? What are you talking about? And she said, you know, be my eyes and ears. And I thought, well, that is a very common phrase in organizations. And that can be interpreted a lot of ways. And well, especially if it gets utilized and then the person finds out. Or it's the intent you know, behind that, too. Right. The manager's thinking, you know, hey, I can't be there. I trust you. You're my right arm. Be there for me. Right. And that person might interpret it as, you want me to tattletale on everybody else. Yeah. And so or, or I want you to represent me at, at this meeting, and I trust your capability in being able to do that. And, you're, you know, we, we hope that's what they think. You hope, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes we, we break trust. Okay, so it happens, intentional, unintentional, we've broken trust. When we think about restoring trust, we have to think about first understanding what it was that we did. First and foremost, we need to accept responsibility and accountability for the actions and be specific in what it was. Because if somebody, you know, comes to you and you're like, I'm so sorry, and they say, for what? <laughs> you, you know when they say, for what? That you didn't actually present the information of what 
uh, of your understanding of the impact of your actions. So somebody needs to hear that you get it. And then they need to hear what you're going to do about it. It the sounds like a I'm, conversation with my wife, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's everywhere. <laughs> but here's, here's the thing, and this might also make it sound like you and your wife. Um, here's what you don't want to say. Don't say, what can I do to make it better? Mm-hmm. Because that's putting the responsibility on them to tell you how to fix it. Mm-hmm. Once you've said, here's what I'm going to do, and here's how I'm going to uh, adjust, and here's what I've learned, then you can say, is there anything else that I can do? But don't start with, what can I do to make it better? That puts it all on them. You remember back in the 80s, Audrey, people used to say, what can I do to make this go away? <laughs> <laughs> but that lines up with your lens through all of this view of connectors and being a good one in that it's a very giving position as opposed to what can I get out of it and what can I take? And so that approach lines up with that. And, you know, when I think about the title of the book, The Connector's Advantage, people are, are always saying, you know, wh- why is this important? And we talked a little bit about why it might be important for the organization. Um, it's also important for the individual. Whatever it is they're working on, whether it's a promotion or a raise or getting that client or, or, um, or building a business or even happiness or health, whatever it is they're working on, they're going to get that result faster, easier, better. <laughs> That's, that's the tagline, faster, easier, better, whatever it is. And the higher up the connector spectrum you grow, the faster, the easier, and the better the result will be. Yeah, what are some of the ways that you see the ROI when you change your orientation toward the way that you're connecting? Um, what are some of the measurable ways that you've seen with your clients, um, you know, beyond, you were saying productivity shoots up within companies? <laughs> the speed at which things happen. So, for example, um, I was working with somebody, uh, Johnson & Johnson, and he um, basically had a reputation of uh, being slow, yet he was brilliant. It wasn't being communicated out. He wasn't connecting with the people that were around him, so they didn't get him. And we started working on it and, and helping him build relationships within different areas and different divisions of the organization. Within six months of us working together, he got a promotion. Within a year and a half of that, he was on a global team that was highly visible, that wasn't even in his radar that he was going for. That's, a, that's an anecdotal story, but if you have a mentor, you are 70% more likely to get a promotion with an active mentor relationship. When you are seen as likable, when you have those relationships, the ideas that you put forth are listened to, you are more influential, you are viewed as more trustworthy and credible, and they take the ideas you have and they morph them and improve upon them. And so your contribution has impact. And don't even get me started on health. <laughs> the, the stats there are kind of scary. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some research out of Brigham Young University. I don't know if you've seen this, but I was floored when I read that uh, social isolation has more impact on mortality than obesity. And we've wow. seen headlines recently about loneliness. I mean, with all the social media that we have and everything like that, 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 that people today are more lonely than ever. Yeah. And loneliness is a greater cause of mortality. It is equivalent to smoking, I think it's 15 cigarettes a day for 10 oh, years. Oh, wow. It's crazy. It's weird because we, our technology has us more connected than ever. The fact that we're in three different cities talking to each other like this is amazing, but yet we're, we're lonelier than ever. What yeah, does that we're, say? We're more connected than ever, but we're actually less connected than ever. It's a different form of connection. Yeah. yeah. I think what people are missing is the, the face-to-face, the voice-to-voice. And I think that we have less and less of that because there's more and more of this digital uh, format for communication. There's I mean, I've spent my entire teenage years on the telephone and our kids are spending their entire teenage years uh, texting. It feels feels very different. It's like we have, we have all the lyrics to to the songs when we have no music. Yeah. (laughs) I like the way that is. Yeah. It's a nuance of the communication. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that survey and some of the research that you've done and some of the other characteristics or statistics that you had that came out of that, that, can be uh, helpful in us learning about what makes a good connector. So I had some theories going into doing this survey, and what fascinated me is that there wasn't a huge amount of differentiation on many of the characteristics between connectors and non-connectors. 
Um, however, there was a couple of highlights. But what, what it really made me realize, and that's kind of how why I switched the book, because the book was originally called The Connector's Club. And what I realized was, you know, you don't have to be in the club. You need to access the advantage, and anybody can do it, because there is not a certain way that you have to be wired to be a connector to infuse these mindsets, that anybody can access them, and that was really exciting for me. Um, the one thing that I saw that really jumped out at me was that connectors feel a sense of personal satisfaction from connecting other people. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the um, biggest differentiators was that they felt that that in itself was gratifying. Yeah, when I've been in the presence of a super connector, as I call it, um, I can tell the difference in the way immediately in the way that person engages with me and they reach out to me more frequently. They're always trying to introduce me to other people in their circle. <laughs> They're much more active. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, when think about leveling up, Right, so there's seven levels of connector from non-connector to global super connector. And there's two levers that you can pull. One lever is the initiation versus the responsiveness. So when you're just starting out, you might be more responsive to request to connect or responsive to request for help. As you level up, you're going to initiate more of that activity. And then you become more of an acting connector. The other, the other lever that we can pull to kind of get up to the top spectrum of connector is the breadth and depth of our connections. So the depth would make you a niche connector, right? So Audrey, you know everybody in your town or in this in media or in podcasting, um, that's a niche. When you have breadth, when you are now outside of your industry, outside of your hierarchy, um, outside of your demographics and geographics and all of those things that kind of silo us, then you become a super connector. And when you cross your country's borders, you're a global super connector. That means getting outside your comfort zone. Yep. <laughs> yeah, one of the things is I'm going to take page 102. I'm going to cut out the top part of page 102 and probably tape it onto my monitor for, for me to look at at the end of every day. I love this. You talk about you have seven acknowledgement opportunities that I really think, quite frankly, should be like a, like a uh, I don't know, a, a day in review affirmation type, type of thing. Do you want to share some of those with, with, with the... Uh, with managers and, and bosses here? Sure, and this goes back to your original question around trust, is about that self-trust. Sometimes if we don't have that self-confidence, that self-trust, um, that self-belief, we need to help ourselves build it. And so some of the questions are, you know, what is one thing I did well today? Or um, I'm proud that I blank. Um, I had a good encounter with, or especially give yourself credit when you overcome an obstacle. I handled that well. Um, you know, I didn't let this get me down. I had a positive impact on so-and-so. That's my favorite. <laughs> I like to think about it as a little bit of like a success file. And I encourage people to keep these things. So I get emails. Oh, thanks so much. I got this out of this webinar or love that podcast. And I put them all in an electronic folder. And if I need to kind of give myself a little boost, I'll go and read some of them. <laughs> you feel like it's hard for, uh, for, for people to trust you if you don't trust yourself? Yes, I do. I, I think that's a great question. Uh, and I always say, you know, you have to like yourself first. You have to trust yourself first. Because if you don't like you, why should somebody else? If you don't believe you, why should somebody else? Yeah, we're our own worst critics. That's mm -hmm. the problem is getting around that. <laughs> you know, it, it kind of gets you to a certain point. What got you here won't necessarily get you there. It's like, you know, all the hard work and the refinement that you, that you have achieved by beating yourself up over time or whatever, it gets you to a certain point, but then it starts to limit you and uh, actually become more destructive than helpful. There's a technique and um, it's probably on my blog. It's in my original uh, book, the likability book, um, be your own best friend. And it's one of those yeah. techniques that can help us manage some of that negative self-talk. I have a friend of mine who says, let yourself off the hook. Yeah, self-compassion is not overrated. <laughs> it's not it's at very all. important. Yes. Well, it's Michelle Tillis Letterman com. Michelle is with a double L, everybody. And your Twitter is MT Letterman. And uh, get the book on Amazon. You also on, she's got a fabulous website, everybody. You've got it's to go really look nice. at this. It's really nice. Really nice website. And uh, obviously, you know, uh, booking her for uh, speaking and uh, various sundry other things. We encourage you all to go and visit Michelle Tillis Letterman com. Michelle, thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. Great conversation. Thanks. 
Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend on iTunes, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more great information at salesfuel.com.